So this is what we've got so far. We've uh, started to touch a little bit of CSS again, specifically embedded CSS. So we've got to talk about the three types of selectors that we can use. It's just a fancy way of saying, you know, what's this, what's this rule or what's this way that I can select and change things in the document. Previously, we attached it right to this, right to the tag. That worked, but it's not the best. This is better. Later, we'll look at the best. But a better way is this way. So we have to define a selector to control something within the document. Um, and therefore, well, it looks like what we can do is all of these tags here, we can just write some CSS rules for them, and we can change them. We can. Perhaps during the break you thought, well, what happens if I do something like, you don't have to do this, but what if I did label curly braces, background color, you know, hopefully you, you might have been a bit curious, yellow, if you didn't do it, that's okay. But what I'm getting at is that, yes, you can basically redefine the look of the defaults of just about any tag. We had used the label tag, therefore I'm going to select it and redefine it. I'm just playing with colors at the moment, but I could deal with drop shadows and rounded corners and rotating things and animating things. It could be pretty complex. But yes, I changed the default behavior of name by just creating a new selector for it. So we need to deal with, there's three selectors, there's three ways, at least, to control the things on my screen. This way that we're doing it right now is one way, which assumes there is some tag on screen that I can target to change. Hmm. Can I target the input tag? I can. It's a little more complex, but I can. Before we do that, let me make the notes. There are three. Actually, a few more, but we'll just say there are three types of CSS selectors. We have the tag selector. <coughs> used to redefine the look of an existing tag. Existent tag. That's what we've been doing here. We have various tags that exist. Not that we wrote them, but that they exist in the standard, the HTML standard of all of the 200 tags. So we are redefining the look of an existing tag. There may be a case where there is no tag, or there may be a case that if I were to do something like this, P with a color, but I wrote seven paragraphs, all seven of those paragraphs would become yellow. I want two of them to be yellow and three of them to be blue and one of them to be white. I want to target individual paragraphs. So this would be like a global method. It would be too powerful. It would apply it to too many things, the tag selector method. So then we have two more <coughs> methods here, two more selectors. We have the class selector used to target to redefine or to define multiple elements or individual elements. Let's be more specific, multiple elements. And that definition sort of sounds like tag, but used to target or define multiple elements. Usually we create it. We create the class. We invent it. The tag selector applies to a tag that exists. We can make up our own tags, kind of. That's not really the best word, but we can make up our own code. We can make up our own tags, our own classes. We can make our own classes and apply our own CSS styling rules to our own classes. Um, it would look like this. Let's, let's try this, actually. We've got body h1, and let's say we're going to make a brand new um, selector here, and we will type dot red text, curly braces. Notice I wrote it with a dot. 
the dot means it's a class. Dot. It's hard to write it here. Dot means class. And I can do everything that I did with the other types of CSS rules here too. Red text. Well, this means that background color will make it white and text color will be red. We've made up our own sort of tag, but it's a class. We've made our own class that we're defining things to be white background red text. Okay, we've defined what we want this to look like, but we haven't actually said where do we apply it. Where do I want to apply this red text? I want to apply this red text to this label. So I want to tell the web browser, apply red text to that label. The way we do that is, let's jump down to label. We've got the attribute for. Let's give it a new attribute. Class equals red text. That's how we tell it. And notice, it's a very specific syntax. No dot right here. It's just something you'll have to memorize. Class equals red text. No dot, because the dot means class. Up here, dot red text. Class red text. Class equals red text. That's just the way it is. When they invented CSS in 1996, that's how they did it. Everyone voted on it. That's how it is. Save it and run it. See, it should cause your label text to become red with white background because that's what we said it should be. Let's see if that works. Yep. Not, not a good color combination, but white background, red text. This label has been marked as a class to use red text. The beauty of this of CSS embedded, like I said, is that you can reuse it multiple times. It's in a central place. We can change it. Therefore, let's do this. I also want to see, well, let's apply that red text class to something else. What about this input? Okay, class equals red text. And just for fun, I'll also apply it to the other input item. You may ask, does the order of me adding this matter? It does. And we'll talk about it in detail later. Call it red text. So I'm adding class red text to both of those buttons. Save it and run it. Look at that. White background red text white background red text. The button looks different than it did a moment ago because we're def redefining its, uh, its built-in <coughs> its built-in nature. But this is a CSS class selector. I said previously we could have uh, done the P tag, all P's will change throughout my whole document something like this, I can apply it judiciously as I need it. What's also cool about this, I can simply go back to the original definition and say actually I want background color pink, well, I already did pink, uh, brown, and uh, text color gold. That will then automatically trickle down to everywhere where red text has been applied. Never mind that it's still called red text. It'll just take what's in the curly brackets and apply it everywhere where red text is marked. Again, the power of CSS. Everything at once, instantaneously, changes to my new definition. Here's a trick. Double click on red text. And Notepad++ then highlights all instances of where you've written red text. I like that. It helps me find something quickly within my code. Just double click an instance of something like H1. Everywhere there's an H1 it highlights. So you've got hundreds of lines of code. I like that because then it highlights everything that I can get through it. So I see there, you got to use it everywhere. 
So you should see that the class, since we defined it as red text, it can be anything we want it to be called, and it'll obey what how we what properties and values we define. Never mind that now it doesn't it doesn't match. It's actually gold text. So okay. I should call that then gold text. Problem? Yeah. What? I also need to change my class names. Now it doesn't know what does red text mean. I only know what gold text means. So if I were to save and, and run this, it would ignore it, and it goes back to normal. So I double click that, it highlights nowhere else. Of course, it's not the same thing. So then I would have to go here. Yes, this would be annoying. I would have to go in here, although I can do find and replace very quickly here. Let's say I do change all of these to gold text. Let's say I misspelled that one. And so everywhere that I applied gold text to and spelled it properly, it would apply it. This is the second kind of CSS selector. This is a uh, used to target or, or, or define multiple elements. We create it. We name it whatever we want. Again, it's two words, so I put a capital T. This would have worked just fine if it was a lowercase t. But I have to use the lowercase t everywhere. This no longer works. Capitalization does matter. Gold text lowercase is different than gold text uppercase. You can see it ignored it. So this is going to trip us up a lot. I've taught this class a year, for a few years now. People always mess this up. They called their elements capital letters, lowercase letters, and they forget at one point to use the capitalization, and they call me over, why doesn't it work? I look at it, and right away, put a capital T here, but not here. So pay attention to what you call your things, your elements. So classes, very useful to apply style throughout our document. The third type of selector is the ID selector. Used to target one element per document. We create it. This one is marked with a hash mark, a pound sign. Means ID. The ID selector is the third one that we might use. It has a purpose as well. Um, and the way we would write this is pound, let's say, um, Just to be easy, uh, I don't know, purple text, color, background color, yellow, text color, purple. Oh, made a little mistake here. Um, we that that's a stray semicolon. I put there on accident. Uh, not necessary right there. Notice it didn't matter. Sorry about that. On the gold text, um, no curly, no semicolon at the end after that curly brace. It should have been right there. Put it on accident, didn't matter at that point. Okay, so this is the structure of writing an ID. Um, an ID selector for CSS. The way we would use it is form ID equals purple text. Class equals or ID equals. So another attribute of ID equals purple text. 
Again, we do not put the pound sign in the quotes of the ID because ID is right there. ID, the, the pound sign means ID up there, and we don't put it down here. In the HTML block, in the CSS block, that's the syntax. There's that syntax. Here we go. Yellow background. But I had said purple text. This text is not purple. Um, here we're seeing that this is what I'm saying about the order of things. Remember, CSS is cascading style sheets. The order of our code does matter. So the web browser is going to start from line 1 and go to line X and process every line and display it on screen. So therefore, it's going to start at the top, and then it's going to see it's going to process our code, and then it's going to get over to form and say, OK, we're going to apply purple text. <clears throat> so yellow and purple. And it doesn't. But then it gets to this point on the next line. Now it's saying, OK, now apply uh, brown and gold. So it doesn't. And that took over because it came later. And so uh, one was more specific. So this one took over, took over that one. I'm going to remove, uh, for the moment, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to remove the class out of that input. It's a little hard to tell, but there's purple. These colors are clashing terribly. But that's purple. You can't tell on the projector, but it's purple. And um, there's the yellow of it all. Let me make it visible. White. There we go. Purple. So I, uh, I had the cas cascade going on. Apply, uh, apply white and purple to the form. I didn't say anything about the label, so it kept it. And then later on, the other items got those classes, and then it and then it changed it. The big difference between the class, they both seem to be doing the same thing to target elements in our design. The big thing about when to use or why to use a class in ID, as I said here, use to target multiple elements, use to target one element per document. Only one thing in my whole document can be set to purple text. If I try to use it elsewhere, the web browser should not uh, like it and, and honor it. The specification says this should not work on any other elements. Some web browsers are loosey-goosey about it and let it happen. But you shouldn't assume that this will work. One ID for one thing throughout your whole document. You might say, that's so limited. Why would we ever do this? You have one footer in your website. You have one header in your website. You have one sidebar. You have one element in your document. You don't need three footers. You have one block at the bottom to display the copyright. That is a, po a possible reason that I create something called footer, purple text. Apply this to only the footer. I've only got one footer. That could be a reason to do that. Um, if I have a lot of paragraphs, that I want to apply this, I, I could call this paragraph, let's just say P, gold, text. And therefore I can apply it to multiple paragraphs. That's why I would use a class. I'm going to have a lot of things I want to look the same way, but I have one footer that I want to define its design, and one header, and one logo. So that's why I might want to use the ID. It'll make more sense as we do it especially when we create these, these apps with these multiple screens and such. That's what I've got so far.
one more thing, then we'll go on with um, some JavaScript. Um, I think the spacing is way too tight. The color, uh, the color bumps up right to the edge of all of these elements. I want a little bit of space. We mentioned that CSS property previously, padding. Based on my lines of code here, what line number perhaps might I go to uh, fix this so that I don't have so much, so it's not so close, that the, uh, the padding is not so tight? What line number in my case? I think I heard someone say 13. You're right. So we'll go to line 13, purple text, and I'll call that padding and 25 pixels. Let's see how that looks. So now there's a little bit of space on all four edges of that box. Remember, specifying one padding value applies to all four sides of the element. That's good enough. We can play with it some more. We can uh, maybe make a little space here. I think we can do that one with line height. Again, I don't have all of these memorized, but we can look it up. But let me just check this line height. I do it. No. So we can figure that out later. <coughs> but here's what I've got so far. And um, we can, of course, keep exploring and add pictures and all of that. But we've done some HTML to create a structure, the content layer. We've played a little bit with CSS, and there's still much more to learn, of course. But that was our uh, presentation layer design doesn't look so boring anymore. Maybe I don't have the best sense in color design, but I can fix that later. Now let's deal with a little bit of the interaction layer, the, um, the behavior layer, some JavaScript to make this work. It doesn't do anything yet. Any questions before we go on to that? Okay, so JavaScript also can be inline, embedded, and external. For the moment, we'll skip just straight to embedded. Later on, we'll do external. We're going to put a block where all of our JavaScript will exist so we can get to it quickly, so we can edit it um, efficiently. This is when things get a little tricky, because you can, you can look it up online, and there's discussions about this. Uh, we can actually choose where to add our JavaScript. It'll be embedded, but we can still choose. Do we want it up um, up at the top of our document or at the end of our document? And there's schools of thought of both of why either would work. But the more con the consensus seems to be more toward add your JavaScript at the end of the document for various reasons. They'll be more apparent as we go on. But think about, as I said, that the web browser is going to render the code or it's going to process the code from top to bottom. And we will see when this is more complex later. It could happen that we write some JavaScript code to apply to something that doesn't exist yet. If we wrote our JavaScript up here, it's going to stop at that point, try to process that JavaScript, and it'll say, give me what's in the box to do something with it. But we stopped right here. The rest of the code hasn't been processed to even make the box. So the consensus seems to be, let's put our JavaScript at the end. Let's give everything a chance to load up first and process. Then let's write our JavaScript to deal with it, so we can double back to it. So before the end of body, we will write our script block. It has a pair. And in the old days, we would have to type, don't type this, we'd have to type type equals text slash JavaScript. It's not the old days anymore, don't worry about that. In the old days of the old web browsers, we would have to tell it what kind of script, what kind of extra code does our document have. With an HTML5 standards compliant document, it assumes JavaScript, not PHP, not CGI, not ASP, not C++, whatever. This script means JavaScript. So everything that we're going to write in here will be JavaScript. And HTML itself could be a 200 page thick book. CSS itself could be a 200-page thick book, and JavaScript could be a 300-page thick book. So all three of those 
can be a big complex topic. We're just doing a crash course day one and day two. Check out the recommended books in the syllabus to learn more. But again, you don't have to know everything about JavaScript to make it do what you want, and we'll start slow. The first thing we'll do here is, for practice, we will see that JavaScript can can auto can automatically execute, or it can be executed with a trigger. We'll do the automatic way first. Uh, let's write this alert. Open parenthesis, close parenthesis, semicolon. There's a semicolon at the end right there. This is going to the short answer, this is going to run the alert command in JavaScript. Technically it's the method. This is the JavaScript alert command. Uh, in the parentheses, we'll say quote, end quote, and then some message. We'll start off again with the classic, hello world. Here's our first JavaScript command. Save it and run it. See what happens. Alert, open parenthesis, close parenthesis, semicolon, end of line. Quotes, and then some message. Save it and run it. What do you get? Oh, I got a pop-up. Hello world. I click OK. Did everyone get a pop-up that said hello world? So that was our first JavaScript command. Technically a method, a JavaScript method. Yes, there's this jargon and terminology that we should learn. And we'll learn it little by little, but this is our, our first JavaScript command. What we've done is made an alert. There's a built-in JavaScript command that makes a simple pop-up box. Like we were writing comments in our HTML code, we could have written comments in our CSS, we forgot to, but we can also write comments in our JavaScript. Though the difference is that the JavaScript and the CSS comment tag is different. In JavaScript and HTML, we write it like this. I'm going to back up before alert and write slash, asterisk, space, asterisk, slash. This is a comment. And the asterisk is shift 8. So we don't use the HTML comment tags because this is not HTML. It's JavaScript. This also works up on CSS. This is a comment in CSS. This can be broken into multiple lines. I can move this down here, write something else here. It, it should be green. That's a comment. And anything that I write here is a comment. And again, I can put this over here. And what I've done is deactivated the alert command, the alert method, because it's part of the comment block. It worked a moment ago. Now it shouldn't anymore. I deactivated it. Alert is a method. JavaScript that displays a simple pop up box. What's that? All right, let's take a look at this. Could be that um, it might have been this. So what happened is when you run this, it did the pop-up, I close it, and it never comes back. There's no way for me to bring it back. There was no trigger. 
there's no trigger that I can hit to make it come back. That was that was a function that activated itself, that ran itself right away. Because again, the web browser, whatever you're using, run, uh, looks at every line of code from top to bottom and then executes it, runs it. So when it got to this point, it ran, it saw that and then executed it. It did alert, and then it went away. And there's no other way to make it loop back to that unless you refresh. Then it'll pop up again because it ran the code again. It refreshed the code, found that, and it ran it again. We will have other ways, of course, to trigger that. What about if we have a button and click the button to make that happen? We can do that. We will do that. This code, we saw that it works, but it's going to pop, keep popping up and bothering me. So I'm going to comment it out. And JavaScript actually has two ways to comment. We have this multi-line method, and we have this single-line method. If you put two slashes in front of a line, that whole line is deactivated. Only that one line. Double slash. And the space is not necessary there, but I like to put a space to separate it. But that line now is deactivated. I do that all the time. I'm writing this code, I'm checking it. Okay, I often run these sort of like little tests. The test worked. I don't want to delete the code. I might want to use the code for something else later. So I can just deactivate it. That's a very quick way. Double slash. There's no space between those slashes. If you do, it's no longer a comment. It's an error. Let's deactivate that code. And let's use another built-in JavaScript method. Again, we can look this up. We can look up a, in a book of 400 pages about everything about JavaScript. I can look up on a website everything about JavaScript. You don't need to know everything about JavaScript. Here's another method. Here's another JavaScript command. Prompt. This does something else, but notice it's, notice it's syntax. The syntax is how you have to write things. The syntax up there, HTML attribute equals. We've seen that syntax, the way you have to write it. We're seeing, we, we had seen with CSS, the syntax of CSS is some selector, curly brackets, properties and values. Everyone was the same kind of way. We will see a syntax in JavaScript as well. And I'm seeing some sort of the name of a command, parentheses, semicolon. And the semicolon is at the end of the line. It's like the end. Here's my command. Do it. End of line. <clears throat> but we had added also uh, a parameter. What are we going to alert? What are we going to display? What are we going to prompt for? So let's say quotes, enter username. Save and run that, and right away, this command should execute. Because it's out there on the JavaScript, uh, out by itself, it automatically executes. I don't know what it does yet. Can't wait to save it and run it. Go ahead and do so, see what it does. If I save it and run it, I get a pop-up, enter username. Oh, a little box for me to enter my username. And an OK and a cancel. What happens if I click OK? Nothing. Let me run it again. Put in another name, cancel. So there's a built-in prompt command that will ask you to type something in. I had said type a username. It doesn't matter what you type. But there's a built-in uh, JavaScript method to ask the, the user to type something, and it automatically has OK and cancel. Besides that, it doesn't do anything. I'm not done yet. Um, this project that we're going toward, one version of it, I have it at 131 lines of code. And uh, the first 30 lines of code are the HTML things. The next 100 are the JavaScript things. So the next 100 lines of code is going to be the JavaScript. That's going to be the part that is complex. As I said previously, HTML, easy. CSS, a little harder. 
JavaScript artist. We'll get there eventually. 100 lines will be the easy one. Later we'll have 500 lines of code of just JavaScript on top of our 50 lines of HTML, on top of our 90 lines of CSS. These are just some proofs of concept just to show you. Here's a little JavaScript. It does something, but we need to be specific and make it do more. What we want is that when we click that button, something happens. So we need to write some JavaScript to make that button active so that when we click it, it does something. I'm going to comment those two lines out, and on the next line, I want, on line, in my line 23, I've got an input button, and I'm going to write some JavaScript. I was starting to say earlier, eventually we're going to click this Save button, and it will do a variety of things, such as capture the text placed in the input name ID. We're, gonna, we're, we're going to write, we're going to give an ID also to this button so that it knows that when we write some JavaScript we mean we're clicking this button. So let's go back to where we've got our input button save and let's give it an attribute of an ID. Yes, the ID has a dual purpose of, be, of being for CSS and for JavaScript. We could have that ID to style the button, and we could have the ID as a unique identifier to sort of attach JavaScript to. I'm going to write some JavaScript that will activate once we hit that button. That could be done by identifying that button. Here is where we will write btn save. This is a button on screen used to save the name. We will write JavaScript so that that happens. This is an identifier. Furthermore, in the JavaScript, we will then use the identifier, the ID attached to that input of text, to capture that text. How many of you before this class had heard of HTML. Most people. How many of you had heard of CSS before this class? How many of you had heard of JavaScript before this class? Okay. How many of you had heard of jQuery before this class? Okay. Um, JavaScript is a language that lets us do interaction. Plain old JavaScript. I believe it was invented in 1994 by the Netscape company. Remember Netscape Navigator? Internet Explorer, Netscape Navigator, that great 90s clash. Um, the people over at Netscape had invented this language, JavaScript. And it was a way to make websites interactive. Eventually then that, uh, that code was open sourced and made larger and everyone started to adopt it. Everyone loved it and used it. And it's one of the, one of the glues, it's one of the things that glues together websites nowadays. One of the most valuable languages to learn. It, on its own, is a big old language with a lot of power. It's so powerful. With JavaScript, you can write HTML. You can write CSS with JavaScript. You can control and change HTML dynamically with JavaScript. You can control and change and create CSS with JavaScript. You can do everything. It's very powerful. That's why it's the hardest one, I feel. And so what we're going to do is write some JavaScript to make that button work. So let's write document dot get element by id. Notice the very specific way I wrote this. You have to write it this way. Get lowercase element uppercase by uppercase id uppercase. And this trips people up all the time. It did for me when I learned it. Only an uppercase i, not a capital I and D. Just a capital I. It would have been great if when they invented this, it was capital I, D. But we have to memorize it's capital I, lowercase d. Open and close parentheses. 
And then the parentheses, quote, end quote. That looks a little familiar. This looks like a JavaScript method. Like this, prompt, parentheses, alert, parentheses, get element by ID, parentheses. It is. It's a, it's a JavaScript method. It has something before it. It has an object, whereas these didn't, although they could. We'll get to why later. But for the moment, to complete this, now we're saying, okay, there's something in the document. There's something on the website. Let's get it. Let's access it by its ID. So what do you think we type in the quotes? BTN save. We're trying to activate, mm. we're trying to get that button up here to do something. So we're getting it, we're referencing it by its ID. BTN save. No dot there. Because we've said ID here. Dot on click. This is um, this is waiting for an event to happen on click. Once the button is clicked, do something. We have many of these events on click, on double click, on click and drag, on load. We have all of these possibilities of things that could happen. I've clicked on the button, therefore do something. The website has finished loading, <coughs> do something else. I've left the website, do something else. That's how those annoying pop-ups happen. Have you been to a website? You leave the website and a <coughs> pop-up comes up and says, please don't leave. Or, you know, click here to buy this. You leave a website and there was that event that happened on leave or on unload, I think. You leave the website and it triggers some JavaScript code to run. Here, Clicking on a button, which button? BTN save, will trigger something to happen. So again, this is the syntax of it all. We'll explain the details, but in general it looks like this. And then we have equals. In the beginning the syntax will look weird, then you'll get used to it. We're saying we're going to click something, and then we're going to do something. This equals has a meaning, we'll get to it later, but basically, click something, do something. We're going to use this keyword, this JavaScript keyword, over and over and over for the moment. We'll write it, function. It should turn blue and italicize. If you misspelled it, obviously, it'll remain black, function. Open, close, parentheses. Open, close, curly brace. Semicolon. That ends that particular statement, that line, the end right there. But we're building up something more complex here. Whereas these things happened automatically, this is building up toward click a button and do something. It is much more typing, much more specific, <coughs> much more elaborate typing. I have to do much more elaborate typing here. In the parentheses, in the curly braces, let's write alert method. So alert um, parentheses quotes. And say I clicked it. Save it and run it. Eventually these lines get too long that I can't show the whole thing on one screen full. Hopefully you can see that. But if this worked, what should happen is I save it and run it. Nothing happens. It doesn't say I clicked it. It should not happen automatically. Not until I click the Save button. I clicked it. I can close that. I can click Save again. I click
clicked it. It has a trigger now. It has an event on click, which gets handled, which gets dealt with on the other side of the equals. There's an event, an event handler. On some event, on a click, on a drag, on a load, on a time runs out, some trigger, some event, and a way to handle it. An alert pops up every time I click. This, uh, this basic syntax here we will use a, a few more times throughout our project and this is um, some standard way to do it where we activate a button for it to to do something. Let's pause here. Did everyone get a, a pop-up after you click the button? So Um, so this does one thing. It made a pop-up happen as soon as we clicked on the button. But I need multiple things to happen. I need uh, for, the, for the app to check what's the name in the box, save the name in the box, you know, process it. I need it to do multiple things. Here it only, it only did one thing. Function, that's a new word we're, we've learned it's a it's a it's a um, keyword of JavaScript that we will use over and over. This is what would be known as an anonymous function. Basically, it does one thing as soon as something triggers it. But I need to do multiple things, so this is not the best way actually. I'm gonna delete the alert method. Take it back like that just to curl the races. We are seeing, the point of that was to see that yes, that button now is active. I click the button, it makes something happen. Not exactly what I want yet. It makes something happen. It was like a proof of concept. I'm clicking the button, something will happen. I needed to do multiple things. So therefore, um, I needed to actually not, not run the, the alert command, I wanted to run the name save command. I want to save the name. Whatever the name the person wrote, I want to save it. Well, that's convenient that there's a built-in JavaScript command called name save to save names. Actually, there isn't. We're going to invent it. Just like we invented a class or an ID to make it do something that wasn't built in, we are going to invent our own JavaScript command to do the process of saving the name and retrieving it and alphabetizing it in X number of steps. We're going to invent our own JavaScript commands, our own, uh, our own definition. So notice again, capital letter S. And if we don't use capital letter S elsewhere, it won't work. We have to be consistent with our cases. So all lowercase would have worked just fine, all uppercase. It has to be consistent. Because we're making this up, if we try to, to run this, either nothing will happen or it'll give us an error. So we have to define what does name save mean. On the next line, press enter. <coughs> and we'll write again function space. Notice how I'm writing it here differently. Space name save. Open and close parenthesis. Open curly brace, close curly brace. Notice how I switched around some of these items. This is the syntax to define what does, uh, what does name save mean. And I'm going to write a variety of commands here. So actually, let's back up 
in between the curly braces, and I'm going to press enter two times to break it up like this. I'm going to write a bunch of commands in the middle between all those curly braces. I'm not going to write them all on one long line. It'll get busy, it'll look weird, it'll be hard to maintain. So what we've done is we've broken the curly brace into separate lines. Just to see if we haven't messed up yet, we're going to mess up a lot. Line 34, I'll write again, alert. I clicked it again. Save it and run it. It should do the same thing as before in a different way. I'll explain why in a moment. But it should again, that when you click the button, it should pop up and tell you, I clicked it again. We'll see why we want to do this this way in a moment. See, I'm going to run this, click a button, I clicked it again. Close that, click, clicked it again. So it's going to do the same thing as the previous code, but we're setting <coughs> ourselves up to do more. The way we did it a moment ago with the, you know, with the final command right there, oh, it would only really allow us to easily do one thing. I need to do multiple things. So I'm creating a definition of a function of a JavaScript command I've defined my own JavaScript command right here, basically, where I can make it do multiple things. Let's save it, and let's save it at this point, and uh, I think it's time for a break. So let's save it at this point, and and uh, let's take a break. It's eight twenty-five. We'll take a break until eight thirty-five, and we'll go on.